thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be back, uh, back in Hong Kong. And uh, thank you, Lawrence and Lion Rock Institute for, uh, for hosting me. Uh, I, will, I will mention that uh, Ayn Rand's books now, e even though they, they would be bestsellers in the United States, sell more copies outside the United States in a variety of different languages than in the US. So for the first time, she's kind of this international phenomena. And of course, all her books now are in Chinese. So nobody has any excuse not to read, uh, not to read Ayn Rand. So uh, uh, please do so. And if you're interested in the topic of this talk and you find it stimulating, my book, Equal is Unfair, um, a, about a week and a half ago, was published in mainland China in Chinese. So uh, we have a few copies uh, up there, but um, uh, feel free to buy it in Chinese uh, at some point. So inequality has become, I think, the biggest economic issue uh, in the world in which we live. It's, it's everybody talks about it, and it's presented as inequality is the problem of our time. I mean, there's only one issue bigger than global warming in terms of something to worry about and be afraid of, and that is what's bigger than inequality. No? What is your generation really, really worried about? What's going to end the world in 12 years? Supposedly all are going to die in 12 years, that's the story. Climate change. So climate change is probably the only issue uh, bigger than, uh, than inequality. But uh, when it comes to economics, this is the thing that everybody talks about. Uh, inequality is blamed, it's used as a, as a cause for pretty much every problem that exists out there, economic problem that exists out there, and even some non-economic problems. I've heard people blame terrorism on inequality. But we blame low economic growth rates in Western countries on inequality. We blame the fact that poor have a hard time rising up into the middle class on inequality. In some countries, the middle class is shrinking. We blame that on inequality. All the economic problems, I mean, Donald Trump's election supposedly was caused by inequality, and therefore you could blame tariffs on inequality. So almost everything today, in some way or another, is being blamed on inequality. So what is inequality? How do we define inequality? Well, it's the gap. It's the difference in income, or sometimes we use wealth, between the poor in a particular country and the wealthy. The wealthy maybe being the top 10% or the top 1%, depending on what exactly you want to measure. Sometimes people uh, use as inequality the gap between the middle class and the rich, with the idea that over the last 30 years, the rich have been getting richer and the poor have stayed and the middle class has shrunk. So the gap, the difference between the very rich and everybody else, pretty much everybody else, has been expanding. Right? And this is supposed to be a major problem. And the question is, why is it a problem? And then, you know, you could, you could cluster the arguments about why it's a problem into two. One, economic issues. This, this somehow causes some economic distortion, right? And that causes economic problems. And the other cluster is question of fairness, questions of morality. It's just not fair. It's just not right that some people, you know, go up in wealth so dramatically while everybody else at least seemingly either stays put or only getting better much more slowly. Much more slowly. So economic issues and moral issues are the two arguments against inequality. So let's deal with the, let's talk about the economic issues because I think they're easier to deal with, and quicker to deal with, and then we'll get to the, we'll get to the, uh, the moral issues, which I think are more interesting. So as far as I can tell, and I've read a lot about this topic, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's this big book by Thomas Piketty, who, uh, the French economist who is now 
a worldwide celebrity. I mean, if he was here speaking at the University of Hong Kong, the president of the university would have gone to the airport to greet him, driven in here, and we'd be in an auditorium full of thousands of people uh, because he is such a celebrity and everybody loves this guy. But he wrote a book called Capital in the 12th, 21st century, or as I like to call it, Das Kapital in the 21st century. Just gives it a, it just sounds better in German, uh, and links him to 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 uh, Karl Marx, which is his uh, his spiritual source, um, where he basically makes the case that inequality has grown significantly. Okay, you could argue about that with the data, but let's say he's right. Uh, but it, he, his argument is that it's going to continue to grow indefinitely into the future, up to a point where all the world's wealth will be held by a few people and everybody, all the rest of us, will be destitute. And he says the reason for that is that the return, the investment return on capital investment, is far exceeds and will continue to exceed forever the rate of growth of the economy more broadly, which we supposedly benefit from. So if you have capital, you go, it grows very fast. If you're just part of the economy, you grow very slow. Now what's fascinating about that is that that goes against every economic theory known to man. As the, the, the return on investment has to in the end correspond with the growth rate of the economy. Because what are you investing in? The economy. You can't make more money on investments than there is wealth or the growth of wealth in the economy more broadly. There has to be convergence. And as the return of investment, as more and more capital is deployed, the return will shrink and growth rates will accelerate. So just on economics, it doesn't make any sense. By the way, there was another person who made exactly the same prediction, exactly the same prediction, uh, you know, 150, 170 years ago. His name was Karl Marx. And it never came true, never came true. And yet, Piketty is making the prediction again. Nobody cares. And everybody's, everybody's, you know, believes this prediction. Indeed, there is absolutely, there is absolutely no economic theory. Is this on? No. It just went off. Right? One, two, three. Is this on? No, nope. no it's not on anymore. All right. One, two, three. One, two, three. Oh, wait. And if there's no economic theory, no economic theory, that relates income inequality or wealth inequality with economic problems, with slower growth rate, with lack of mobility among the poor, with shrinking middle class. There's just no theory that would suggest a relationship between a gap, just a difference and the rest of the economy. There's one that people throw out there. And this is, this is the way it goes. We've learned since we were very little that what drives economic growth is what? What is, what is the thing that's most important for an economy to grow? Greed. There must be some economics, e economic students here. Yeah? Greed, is it? Greed. No. <laughs> it can't be greed. Greed is bad. We want economic growth. Consumption. Consumption. Consumption, exactly, consumption, right? Consumption is good. Production, eh. Savings, eh. Investment, eh. Consumption, that's what makes econo economies grow. This comes out of kind of the, the modern Keynesians. I'm not even sure Keynes believed this. Consumption makes an economy grow. If rich people have, uh, if the amount of wealth that rich people has grows, what do rich people do with their money? They consume it? Hoard it. What's that? Hoard it. They hoard it. Right? They don't consume it because how many yachts can you buy? How many airplanes can you buy? How many big houses can you buy? So what happens is rich people don't consume. It's called propensity to consume. The propensity to consume among rich people is low. Who spends all the money they have? Poor people because they, they take all the money and they spend on the stuff that they need just to survive. So if we redistribute wealth from rich people to poor people, what will happen? Consumption will go up, 
and we are told the economy will grow. That's the theory. It's not a very good theory. It's not a theory almost any economist actually believes. And by the way, some people believe... Okay, this is gone too. <laughs> All right. What? Okay. It's, I don't know. It turns itself off. These things turn themselves off. Uh, it's a really bad theory. Why? Why is it a bad theory? What actually leads to economic growth? Saving. Yeah, saving and investment. Think about it this. Let's forget about this. It's useless. Um, think about it this way. How do you consume? How do you get the money to consume? Where does the money to consume come from? From where? From paycheck. From paycheck. So what do you have to do to get a paycheck? Work. So in order to consume, you first have to... Oh, this is still gone. <laughs> uh, in, order to, in order to consume, you first have to produce. You first have to have a job. You first have to make something and get paid for having made something. And then you can go and consume. So before consumption, there has to be production in your part. But there's another production that has to happen before you can consume. What production is that? What other act of production has to happen for you to be able to consume? Somebody has to make the thing that you want to buy. So for every act of consumption, there's actually two acts of production that have to happen. You have to produce to get the money to be able to buy the thing. And the person who is selling you the stuff has to have produced it. Somebody has to have produced it in order to sell it to you. The primary activity in an economy, the thing that drives economic growth, the thing that drives an economy is production. Consumption is easy. I give you a few, you know, hundred dollars and put you in a mall. Somehow you manage to consume very easily, right? Anybody. Production is hard. Production requires thinking, effort, capital, organization, management, entrepreneurship. Production is really difficult. The challenge in an economy is how to spur production, how to spur business creation, how to spur entrepreneurship, how to spur job creation so that people have the money to be able to consume. You need to first have a job. So production is always primary. And what creates production? Investment, capital. There is no production until you deploy capital to an idea. Entrepreneurship is what ultimately creates production, which ultimately creates consumption. So economic theory is upside down in terms of this argument about inequality. It's not consumption that drives an economy. And it's sad to see this repeated over and over and over again. It is the challenge of producing stuff. It is creating an environment which encourages production, investment, and saving. Americans are very good at consumption, very bad at saving. So how come, how come America does so well? Who's saved? Who's been saving that has bailed out America? Chinese. The Japanese. The Chinese. Asia generally. You're savers. We're consumers. And for now, your saving have funded capital investment in the United States. And that, is, that, is, that has created economic growth. One of, the, one of the many reasons why a trade war with China is super dumb, to be, to be generous, right? Because there's nothing to gain by it and everything to lose. America depends to a large extent on capital, on saving, investment, and of course cheap goods, which increase the quality of life in the United States. So the whole economic argument around uh, inequality is, is just empty. There it goes again. <laughs> There's just nothing there. There's no there there. There's no... It's gone again. 
Oh, it's back again. All right. Uh, there is no legitimate economic argument that says that the gap is problematic. Now, it's true. There are lots of economic problems. Uh, you know, the poor mobility among the poor, the ability of the poor to rise up, is much slower in, in the West, at least, than it used to be. It used to be much easier for a poor kid who's ambitious, who wants to work, to be successful. Much easier 50, 100, 200 years ago, or 150 years ago than it is today. So one has to ask the question, why? Economic growth has slowed in the West significantly. One has to ask the question, why? At the top, there's a lot of cronyism. You know, people who haven't produced, but are somehow rich. And that's bad. All these are real economic problems. But not a single one of those problems has anything to do with inequality. Indeed, I would argue it's the opposite. It's our attempts to reduce inequality by redistributing wealth, by having a minimum wage, by having all kinds of restrictions on entrepreneurs, regulations, controls, that actually restrict production, restrict the number of jobs that exist, limit the growth in productivity. And if you don't have growth in productivity, what happens? Wages stagnate. If you don't have growth in productivity, it's very hard for somebody who's poor and ambitious to rise up. How does the minimum wage keep people poor? Minimum wage is one of the most evil tools ever invented because it keeps people poor. How does it do that? Can't find the first job. Can't find the first job. So let's say the minimum wage in a lot of places in the US now is $15 an hour. Most inner city poor kids have gotten a lousy, horrible, terrible education. And they don't know anything. So their productive ability is at around $6 an hour. So they can literally produce. If you give them all the tools, because they don't have a good education, and because they don't have any skills, they can produce $6 an hour. Who is going to pay somebody $15 an hour if they can only produce $6 an hour? Nobody. So they'll never be employed. Because I'm not allowed to pay them $6 an hour. I could go to jail if I paid them $6 an hour. And at $15 an hour, I'm not hiring them. I'll find somebody else who can actually produce at if I pay somebody $15 an hour, how much do they have to produce at? Simple economic question. How much? At least 15. Yeah, more than 15. I've got to make a profit off of them. Right? How am I going to make a living if I pay them exactly what they produce? So it has to be more than 15. And that will determine how much money I make off of my employees. Every employee in the world gets paid a little less than what they actually produce because the employer, you know, has to be paid somehow. So a whole group of people in the United States are never going to have a job. And there's no better way to keep people poor than never giving them a job. Because the only way to rise out of poverty is through work, is through having a job. So all these economic problems, uh, the low growth rate in the economies, are consequences of regulation, consequences of high taxes, consequences of redistribution, consequences of, of, of restraints on entrepreneurship. Instead of looking at solutions for those, we're obsessing about uh, something that doesn't matter one iota, which is the gap. So let's talk about how this gap happens. Right? How does this gap happen? How do, how do we get people who are rich and people who are not so rich? Why do some people get rich? How do some people get rich? How do you become a billionaire? This is, this is cool. Right? This is the secret to success. <laughs> how do you become a billionaire? You, you take risks, but you know, 
Lots of people take risks, right? Sometimes when I'm driving out there, I'm probably taking a little bit too many risks. Doesn't make me money. What kind of risks? Or what's, what's unique about the risks that people who become wealthy take in order to become wealthy that differentiates them from everybody else? What do they have to do? Invest it. They invest it again. People invest money all the time. But only some people get rich. Really rich. I mean billionaires. How does a billionaire become a billionaire? They provide something that people want. They provide something that people want. Again, a lot of people do that. But what, what is the difference with a billionaire? They provide something that a, a, lot, of a lot of people want. How many people? Yes. Like hundreds of millions or billions. Like if I can produce a product that hundreds of millions of people want and are willing to buy over and over and over again at a profit, I'm going to be a billionaire. That's the secret to being a billionaire. Now, why do people want it? And why are people are willing to pay for it enough to give you a profit? Why? Because they hate themselves and they want to make themselves poorer? I'll give you an example. You know, this income inequality has really made me really aware um, and, and as a consequence of income inequality, I really, really resent Harry Potter. Everybody read Harry Potter? No? Never made it? Damn read Harry Potter. <laughs> you gotta read Harry Potter. <laughs> So like, Harry Potter is a series of books. <laughs> this is the magic. <laughs> a series of books that J.K. Rollins wrote. And uh, what you observe is that J.K. Rollins is today a billionaire. A billionaire. She made over a billion bucks from these books. Now the thing that really upsets me is, she became a billionaire and I got poorer. Because I've done the math, and I spent at least, I don't know, $3,000 on Harry Potter. I mean, really, right? Like, every book came out, right? My kids, I have two boys, and they were about Harry Potter's age. So every book that came out, I had to buy two copies. <laughs> right? One for each one of them, because they wouldn't wait until one read it, and then they would have to read it the night it came out. I'd, I'd go in line at midnight. And as they grew older, they could stand at midnight, but you know, in the beginning, I would go. And we'd get the books, and then they would read them. But then I wanted also to, to, to read Harry Potter, because I think the original one I read to them, and then I got caught up. So then we got the audio tape, right? And then we'd take a road trip, and they would hear it for the second time, and I would listen to it for the first time, and you know, we'd all as a family experience Harry Potter. And then there were movies. Like nine of them, there were only seven books, but somehow it turned into nine movies. <laughs> and then there were rides in Disneyland, and I don't know, at least $3,000. So here's the thing about inequality, right? J.K. Rollins became a billionaire, and I got poor by $3,000. That's just wrong, right? Why is that, why doesn't that really make sense? Did I get poor by $3,000? No. But if you're Thomas Piketty, if you're an economist, not to pick just a Piketty, and what does an economist do? An economist looks at my bank account, and he sees that my bank holdings went down by $3,000. And he sees that the $3,000 flowed into J.K. Rowling's bank account, and she got richer by $3,000. All an economist sees is that one party got rich and one party got poor. That's inequality. Inequality is expanded, right, by, by $6,000, her $3,000 of mine. Inequality just got much worse. What's missing? The value I got for the $3,000. And the problem with it is that it's not material. Nobody captures that value. Now, how much value do you think I got from Harry Potter if I paid $3,000 for the whole thing? Probably it's $3,000 worth. Well, much more than $3,000. Yeah. Again, $3,000, I kind of be indifferent. But I get much more than $3,000 worth of value from it. So I am richer, spiritually. Granted, Piketty can't measure it. Those poor economists, they can't measure it. It's not in a balance sheet somewhere. I just feel good. $3,000, more than $3,000 worth of spiritual value. And she got richer. But I got richer more than she did. Yeah. 
because she only got three thousand bucks. I got like six, seven, eight, maybe. You know, just having happy kids. How much is that worth? Priceless. Like when you have priceless, exactly, right? So I got super rich from Harry Potter. She got just a little bit richer. But again, if you just look at the money, if you just look at the at the income, so billionaires become billionaires by making our lives better. Whether it's by writing a book and therefore making us spiritually better, by producing an iPhone, how much is this worth? I paid a thousand bucks for this. How much is this worth to me if I paid a thousand bucks? More than a thousand bucks. I mean, this is probably worth, I don't know, tens of thousands, don't tell Apple. <laughs> to me, right? Not only is this a, a, a supercomputer, uh, more powerful than the computer that sent man to Mars, more powerful than, you remember those, uh, no, well, you guys don't remember because you weren't born yet, but some of you remember. <laughs> Those IBM mainframe computers that filled the room. We used to do punch cards and go in and I was I, I, I still remember punch cards, right? And they filled the room and this is more powerful. But it's not just a computer. It's the most amazing communication device ever invented. I mean I can call anywhere around the world at a marginal cost now of zero. Right? It used to be, again, some of us remember long distance charges. When you traveled overseas, you like made really, really short calls once a week because it was so expensive. Now, and I can, not to mention I can video conference with my kids from anywhere in the world at a marginal cost of zero. So, unbelievable communication device. From chatting to speaking to video conferencing. Not just that, what else is this? It's a camera. It's a camera. I mean, I remember having to look around the camera and film. Anybody remember film? Remember what it took to get it developed? And then you'd spool it into the camera and you remember what a mess that would create? I mean, oh my God, you have no clue. You young people have no clue how much, how taking photographs has changed. What else? It's like an entertainment device. I, I can watch movies. Can I can access, what's that? You can read the reporter. <laughs> I can read Harry Potter. From Absolutely. And, and I can listen to every piece of music ever composed by anybody with any performance I want, pretty much, in all of human history at a marginal cost of zero. I have an Apple Music subscription or whatever, right? Zero. I mean, just this is worth. I mean, if you just tried to assemble this 20 years ago, this would cost you millions of dollars. So a thousand bucks is an unbelievable bargain. So yeah, Apple gets rich off of making me richer. So who wins? I win. Yeah, Apple wins too. So Steve Jobs became a billionaire by making me better. The only way to become a billionaire is by making the lives of billions of people better. By making the world a better place to live for billions of people. It's the only way to become a billionaire, unless you're a crook, granted. Or unless you're in bed with the government, which is like a crook. <laughs> Same thing. But if you're actually a productive business person, if you're actually producing and making stuff, not only are you employing people, not only are you making my life better by selling me the goods? You're also making your life better. You're actually using your mind, using your abilities to make your life a good life. So, is it fair that billionaires are billionaires? Yeah. I mean, if I, when I meet a billionaire, once in a while I do, um, I always say thank you. Because the money that they make is a fraction, a fraction of the value they create. Now a lot of people use this kind of statistic, they say like the 20 richest people in the world, and I don't know what the exact number is, but it's something like this, the 20 richest people in the world have more wealth than half of mankind, like 3 billion people. 
You know why? Why do 20 people, richest people in the world, have more wealth than 3 billion people? Why is that? Because they produce more. Because the 3 billion people are mostly subsistence farmers. How much wealth does subsistence farming produce? Zero. Nothing. You eat everything you produce. You consume everything you produce. There's no surplus. There's nothing to trade. So how much wealth is being produced? Zero. So if you add zero to zero to zero to zero a billion times, what do you get? Zero. I mean, if this room was full of students in the United States, I would say I, one person, are richer than the entire auditorium here. Why? Because all of you have student debt. Yeah, so your net worth is negative, which is what you should do when you're a student. You can take on debt. I paid off my debt, and mine is positive. See, even if my bank account has one dollar in it, I'm richer than the whole auditorium because your wealth is negative. I mean, when you do these statistics, it's just demagogy. It's not real. It's just being a demagogue. Yes, three billion people have less wealth than Bill Gates and another 20 billionaires. Yeah, because these guys made something that changed the world. Three billion people didn't. I wish they did. More billionaires, the better. So, the fairness argument and the economic argument really make no sense. The people who become very, very wealthy are wealthy because they produce the wealth. They've created it. Do they redistribute the wealth? Do they take it from other people? No, because the wealth keeps growing. New wealth constantly is created. There wasn't an iPhone before there's an iPhone. That's something new. That's something that didn't exist before. And if you look at entrepreneurs out there, if they do something that already, they're not redistributing stuff, they're creating something new. They're making something that didn't exist before. Wealth is something that when you create it, you add it. The only, the only entity that redistributes wealth is government. It takes from some and gives to others. And indeed, that's not zero sum because that's negative sum because somebody in the middle takes a cut. Right? It costs a lot of money to redistribute wealth, it turns out. There's a massive bureaucracy that has to be paid in order to facilitate it. So people who make a lot of money earn it. Now, you'll be told that uh, President Obama had a famous speech, uh, my favorite Obama speech. Uh, it's a speech where he said, I call it the you didn't build it speech. I don't know how many of you remember this speech, but he went on this speech and said, you businessmen, you didn't build it. You didn't create the wealth. You were born to the right parents. You were born with the right genes. You had a great teacher who taught you and inspired you. You drove to work on government-funded roads. You have employees and suppliers and all the networks and that, that helped you produce what you produced, the venture capitalists, the, the whole ecosystem around you that made it possible for you to produce, at the end of the day, an iPhone. So you didn't build it, society built it. We all pitched in and helped out. And that's a common view. And it comes from a particular moral philosopher by the name of John Rawls, who wrote a book in 1971, I think, called The Theory of Justice. And it's probably the most influential book in modern philosophy. Uh, particularly political theory. If you study political theory, uh, this is what you'll study. You'll study John Rawls. And Rawls said, you don't deserve anything you make. You don't deserve anything you get. You're just a product of your genes and your environment. And if you talk to psychologists, if you go to study psychology, what will they tell you? You are a product of, some of them will say, you're a product of your genes. Right? That's evolutionary psychology. Right, Jordan Peterson and uh, a lot of these guys, Steven Pinker, a lot of these guys, evolutionary psychology. You, you, we, we've evolved in a particular way. We have genes, they express themselves. That's who you are. Whatever your genes are, that's what you are. And then other psychologists say, no, 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 you're wrong. You're actually a product of your environment. It's what your teachers did, it's what your parents did, it's what all these other forces impacted you. And then 
like the radicals say, no, it's a mixture of both. You know, a little bit of product of your genes and a little bit of product of your environment, and it's a mixture. What's missing? Is anything missing? Because if that's true, you don't deserve what you get. It's just an accident. It just happened. Now, it still might be true that we want you to keep it because why, it, nobody else deserves it. But if you work hard, you work hard because your genes dictated you work hard. You just got lucky. So it's luck. It's like a lottery ticket. And, you know, we, we don't feel too bad about redistributing wealth if it's a lottery ticket. So what's missing? Agency. Yeah, well, what's another word for agency? Free will. Free will. I know it's an unpopular, unsexy word. I think it's pretty sexy, though. Free will. You get to make choices. Yeah, you're born in a particular environment. Yes, you have particular genes. Yes, they impact you. But you know who actually decides who you are? Who you will become? Who, what you do with those genes and what you do with the environment? You do. That's why you can have people born in the same environment producing completely different results. You can have twins or siblings who have pretty much the same genes and it produce completely different results. Because you get to shape yourself or not. But or not is a choice as well. Because shaping yourself requires effort. It requires thinking. It requires introspection. It requires making choices. Not making choices or making the wrong choices is also shaping yourself. But at the end of the day, you are product of the choices you made. And it's nobody else's responsibility but yours. I mean, other than freak luck, you know, crazy stuff that happens. But for the most part. So you did build that. You chose to make the effort. You chose to work hard, or you chose to work smart, or you chose to go program instead of going to play soccer or something. It's choices you make, whether you study for the exam or don't study for the exam. And we all know we make those choices. And we all know we face points in our lives where it's really, really tempting not to study for the exam because the party is really hot and it's really cool and I'd rather go to the party. And sometimes we do go to the party and we don't study and it's a choice. And there are consequences, always. So. That is what shapes who we are, and therefore we do build it. We are responsible for our own lives. We are responsible for our own success. And to a large extent, we're responsible for our own failures. And failure is not a disaster, most parts. Again, there are some failures that are. And failures are opportunities to learn and become better, and figure out what went wrong, and make better choices in the future. So, the whole inequality issue, if people are agents, if they have agency, if they have responsibility, if they are choosing, if they, are, if they do build that, then the people who make a lot deserve what they make. People who make a little deserve the little because that's what they make. So why is it an issue? Well, because we have in our imagination this moral ideal that equality is the right. Equality is good. After all, even in the United States Declaration of Independence, the Founding Fathers of America said all men are created equal. Now, they didn't quite mean it, right? Because it was slavery. And they, when they talked about men in that context, they didn't include women. Uh, so there was some, they had to make some fixes to that statement. But the intent was all human beings are equal. But what did they mean by equal? Did they mean that we all have the same stuff? That we all have the same ability? That we all have the same productive capacity and therefore should get the same stuff? No, I mean, they weren't, they weren't stupid and they weren't naive. What did they mean by equality? Kind of right? Yeah, equality of rights. Equality before the law. Equality of freedoms. Every individual is free, free to live his life based on his choices. Every individual is free to live free of coercion, 
free of force, free of authority, to exercise his rationality in pursuit of his values without other people interfering, without the state interfering. So the idea of equality, at least in the 18th century, and I think to, to, to a big part of the, of the 19th century, was the idea of equality of freedom. We're all free. The idea of equality of rights. We all have the right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Not even equality of outcome. Right? Just equality of opportunity. I want the opportunity to score a basket, and LeBron won't give it to me. He'll block every shot I make. He'll take the wall ball away from me if I try to dribble. And you haven't seen me play basketball, but just imagine. I, I, I just don't have it. Right? So how do, we, how do we make me and LeBron equal in basketball? How do you give me a little bit of opportunity to score a basket on LeBron James? Yeah, restrict LeBron James. How do we restrict LeBron James? Because you're not going to make me better. That would take years... It's too late, and even when I was young, you wouldn't have made me better. Not enough to score back. One basket on the Montreux. Not one. Right? This is real. This is just opportunity. It's not even out. How do you make, how do you, how do you give me equal opportunity with LeBron James? Because we're all about equal opportunity, right? How do you give me equal opportunity with LeBron James? You restrict his ability. How do you restrict it? Tie him up. What's that? Tie him up. Tie him up. We can tie him up. <laughs> tie his hands, tie his legs. You guys are gentle. <laughs> you guys are gentle. Usually, within five seconds, somebody says, break his legs. <laughs> right? And I usually say, not enough, you'd have to break one of his arms, too. Because I'm that bad of a basketball player. Right? That's what you'd have to do. You'd have to tie him up, break his legs. You'd have to do in violence. You'd have to do in violence. And this is the point. You cannot establish equality of opportunity or equality of outcome without doing violence on some for the, quote, sake of others. In other words, the only way to achieve equality of outcome, to reduce inequality, is by violating equality of rights, by using force, by using coercion, by stealing and taking and doing violence against the person. So either you're for equality of rights or you're for equality of outcome. You can't be for both. Equality of outcome is about violence. Taxes are violence. Just try not paying them and you'll see the gun come out and the violence manifest. Redistribution of wealth is violence. It's taking my property and giving it to somebody else. I mean, sometimes I think maybe breaking my legs wouldn't be that bad if I got to keep my wealth, right? Because we all say breaking legs, nobody can break legs, that's bad. But taking half my income every month, that's okay. Yeah, right? I mean, half my income is half my life, half my effort, half my ability, half my, I mean, I work hard. And you just take half of it, it just goes. Not anymore, I, I've moved now to Puerto Rico where I pay 4% taxes, that's it. Almost as good, I mean better than Hong Kong actually, in terms of taxes. Um, but when I lived in California, it was 55% of my income, out the door, before I even got to it. That's violence. So to me, every time people talk about equality, I think violence. And, and maybe, maybe the most striking story to me, and this is, I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you this story because this is the image you should have. This is a story you should remember when people talk about equality as if it's a beautiful thing. So not that long ago, uh, you know, probably about 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, so in my world not that long ago, um, there was a group of, a group of uh, young idealistic students who uh, actually lived in Asia, and they, they all went to school in Paris. I went to school in Paris. And um, they all studied with the great French egalitarian philosophers, Camus and Foucault and all these, all these guys who taught them that equality was the ideal. Equality was beautiful. If only we could establish a truly equal society, life would be so much better. This is Marx on steroids, right? It's the real thing. 
And this group actually had the opportunity to go back to the country and actually gain political power. And they had an opportunity to implement this idea of equality. And, but this is the problem they faced. Some people lived in a city and other people lived in the countryside. And that's obviously unequal because there's a lot of conveniences to living in a city. There are economies, you can generate more wealth. There are lots of advantages to living in a city. And people in the rural areas are growing their food. It's, it's a completely different experience. So how do you make them equal? What do you do? Real problem that they face. They had to figure it out. So what do they do? They kicked everybody out of the city. They literally marched them out of the city, forced them to leave their homes, and forced them into the countryside. But now you've got another problem. People now, everybody, the whole population is in the countryside. But it turns out, some of them are good at farming, and other people are not good at farming. Some people are good at foraging. You know what foraging is? Foraging is picking berries and nuts, just picking stuff off of nature, because there wasn't enough farming going around, right? And some of them are not. So for a while, they banned foraging. Nobody could forage. You obviously you create real problems with food production. But you still had even deeper problems. Some of the people were educated. Some were not. Some could read. Some could not. Some were smart. Some not so smart. How do you equate them? How do you make them equal? Because it's wrong to think about equality just in terms of money. What about abilities? Like basketball. How, how do you do it? What's that? Get rid of them. So basically, that's what they did. If you had a degree from any kind of university, if you finish high school, they shot you. If you wore glasses, it was a sign for some reason that you were, you know, in, in, in this world, that you were, could be maybe more intelligent, whatever, they shot you. They killed 40% of their own population. Over 2 million people. All in the name of what? In the name of equality. In the name of a beautiful idea. This is the killing fields of Cambodia. They were the Khmer Rouge. This is Pol Pot. And it's a gang of monsters. And people loved them in the West. I mean, for decades afterwards, Noam Chomsky, the great Noam Chomsky, would praise the Khmer Rouge for the ideals, for the beauty of their vision. They killed two million people in the name of these ideas. The ideal of equality is an evil ideal, is an ideal that leads to nothing but death and destruction. When people are free, if I take any group of people anywhere, you know, just take this classroom as an example, look around the room, they're all different. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. They were all different. You take any group of people and you leave them free. You just don't intervene. You don't use coercion against them. You don't tell them what to think and what to do and how to act. You protect them from one another so they don't steal and lie and cheat. But, uh, you know, lying I guess they can do, but they don't commit fraud, right? But other than that, you just leave them free. And you come back a few years later. Do you think they'll all be equal? No. There'll be massive inequalities. Why? I don't know, because some people are lazy and some people work hard. That's a simple answer. But another answer is some people choose professions that don't make a lot of money. Like, I have a PhD in finance. I could have gone to Wall Street. I had a job office to go work at Wall Street. Actually, run a hedge fund. I could have devoted myself full time to running a hedge fund. But I decided the money wasn't that important. That to me, what's important to me in life is this, what we're doing right now. I love this, if you can't tell. I have a blast. This is what I live for, right? I've literally given up millions of dollars, millions. I know because I know how rich my partner is and I know how rich I am. That gap, I've given up in order to be able to do this. We choose different professions. Some professions make a lot of money because they have a, a significant impact on large, vast numbers of people. People like me, we can't reach millions of people even if we charge a little bit, right? This is free, and look how few people are here. 
I'm just not, you know, Bill Gates reached hundreds of millions of people, I reach thousands of people. I am proportionally poorer than Bill Gates, right? It's just a profession I chose, and I wouldn't exchange it for anything in the world. People choose to be artists, people choose to be investment bankers, people choose to be, you know, uh, teachers, people choose to be entrepreneurs in high tech, and even entrepreneurs in high tech, not everybody becomes rich. So if you leave people free, they're unequal. Inequality is a feature of freedom. It's not a bug. To get rid of inequality means to get rid of freedom. We should embrace inequality because it is a sign that we are free. Thank you. All right, we'll take questions. Yeah. yeah. We, we are in a, a, an organization which is funded by taxing people. How do you, but you're also adding up probably a lot of value that you're generating people who are, you know, how, does that not create a problem? Because it does have some value, doesn't it? Obviously, wouldn't be, society wouldn't be doing it. Well, that, that's a huge assumption. I mean, if society does lots of things that have no value, we've got a trade war with China that has no value, but we're doing it. Um, we're, we go to war often for no, with no value, and we go to war and blow up ourselves and other people and destroy value, not only don't we add value. So the fact that people do something doesn't mean it creates value. People, people do stuff for lots of reasons, value creating not being a, a, a main one. And whether the university creates enough value to justify its expense, how do you know? Because it's funded by tax money, how do you know? Let's say the, the universities in the United States, I'd say universities in the top, that are considered the top universities in the world, in the United States, that I think actually produce massive negative value because they train people to think poorly, they, 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 they inculcate ideas that are wrong, stupid, and destructive, and many of the people leaving those universities can't find jobs. So, but because the whole process is funded by government and subsidized, and student loans and all the rest of it, uh, rational market factors don't play, so we don't know if value is created. See, that's the beauty of a market. A market is not sustainable if value is not being created. But government can sustain stuff for long periods of time without any value being created. Now, what do we do about universities? How do we have universities if government won't fund them? And I don't believe government should fund any of them. Well, imagine if all the universities were privatized. What would happen? Well, your parents' tax bill would go down, so your parents would be richer. Right? And maybe they could afford to send you to university. What about the kids who don't have parents who could afford to do it? Well, my guess is, and this is not a wild guess because this has happened in the past, is universities would create charities that basically would fund scholarships for poor kids. But not just universities. Businesses would create charities to fund it. Because, you know, I, 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 ask, I ask people this question. How many of you would be willing to put a little bit of money aside to a charity in a, in a world where the government didn't fund any education in order for poor kids to go to school? And oh, every hand in the room goes up, right? Okay, so what do I need government for? I have a feeling you could do it more productively than the government did, would do it more, more efficiently than the government would do, right? And that, that's assuming it was needed, I think, as we got richer as a society. And I think if you freed up an economy and you put government in its place and you actually reduced government to appropriate size and function, we would get richer so much faster than we are today that there would be so much wealth in society it would be easy, easy to fund universities and education. People say, oh, if government didn't fund basic research, there'd be no science. Really? I mean, think about all these billionaires. What are they going to do with the money? They don't want to leave it to their kids because that'll spoil the kids rotten. They can't spend it. So what are they going to do with the money? Well, a lot of them love science because they're engineers or they're, or they're, or they're geeks. They, they love science. You think they wouldn't fund basic science? if the government wasn't doing it. But if the government does it, it crowds out private funding. Well, think about Jeff Bezos. You know why Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos is worth, what, $100 billion? 
People say nobody needs a hundred billion dollars. It's ridiculous. Is that true? Now, I think Jeff Bezos absolutely needs a hundred billion dollars. You know why? What does he want to do with a hundred billion? Spend on stuff he wants to do, yeah. Yeah, but what is it that he wants to do that costs a hundred billion dollars? Go to Mars. Go to Mars. So, if we're going to go to Mars, it's probably going to be because of people like, you know, Jeff Bezos, putting his own capital, investing his own money in building spaceships to go to Mars. That's going to require a lot more than $100 billion. So I'm happy there are billionaires who have grand visions, who are ambitious, and who maybe will take my kids and my grandkids to Mars, because I think that's exciting. That's terrific. You know, finally leave this, leave all the bureaucrats and we'll go to Mars. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I, I don't see what the, it, to me, if the universities were based on a private, real private model, where people really had to pay to go to university, the value added would be obvious and the value added would be much greater. I think right now it's hidden. We don't know what the value is. In some cases, it's negative. Do we really need another department of, I don't know, what would it be? Um, you look like you're going to say something. You know, I don't know. Uh, gender studies, or f another feminist uh, department that studies feminist literature, or how non-PC can I get? Uh, you know, uh, identity, whatever. Identity studies, so we can discuss the differences between being yellow, brown, green, blue, and white, and the privilege that each one gives you. And the, I mean, really, we need. Do you think that actually adds anything to humankind? Uh, probably not. It probably is destroying more value than it's creating, and yet it's got funded by the government. So what the hell? Go study that. I, I, I might have offended some people who are actually studying some of these things. But, uh, it's like, no, we need engineers. We need people who can think creatively. We need we need in, we need people who can write beautiful books. We need people who can create beautiful art, and we need people who can create great products that we can all enjoy. We don't need people who can tell us that we're victims and we're, we're products of our race and we're products of our genes and we're products of all this garbage. We don't need people actually destroying us. We need people who can build. Uh, yes, and then you got yeah. uh, uh, My question is, uh, yeah, so I, I do believe that your argument is theoretically perfect, but uh, like in the real world, is there any, and at least level that we can, yeah, or an optimal level of inequality, or of equality, or efforts to achieve equality that we can tolerate. For example, um, like in a free world with no government, there must be some people that who are so dumb or whose productivity is so low, who cannot provide for themselves, or some countries whose environment has so um, like like so polluted, so deteriorated, so they cannot. Uh, maintain a sustainable economy. Yeah. So at the very end, yeah, in the real world, there must be some kind of redistribution. Although it can be inefficient, it can lead to um, uh, a lot of destruction of values. But there has to be. So, so, so I don't is see there a test to yeah. measure what is the optimal level. No, because I don't buy your assumption that there has to be. Uh, first, I, I, I'm not arguing against the existence of government. I just think, because I, I think government is necessary. I don't think you can have freedom without government. Government is a necessary, not a necessary evil, a necessary good. It is necessary for freedom to have government. It's just the right kind of government, limited by the right kind of, right kind of uh, principles. Um, but no, w why? Right. That is, um, let's say there are people in an economy who are not productive enough, or, or whatever, born without hands, or born with half a brain, or whatever. They just can't produce. Right. What do we do with them? Well, who is we, right? First of all, they have a family. Again, I believe that everybody's much richer under circumstances like that. Most families take care of their sick children, right? But let's say they can't. Let's say, take it one level more, right? The family's pretty bad off and they can't take care of, of, of this child. What happens then? Well, again, I'll ask the audience. How many of you are willing to put a little bit of money aside to put into a charity to help those people who really can't take care so of themselves. There's some space of sympathy. So my point is that it has to be done voluntarily. It cannot be done by coercion. I don't allow for one iota 
of coercion in an ideal society, but but a real ideal society, not a, a mythological, you know, a utopia. Once you allow for coercion, it is truly a slippery slope. You know, well, this guy has a half a brain, so we need a coerce to support him. What about the guy with a three quarters brain? We need, well, what about the guy with 99% of a brain? Or, you know, whatever the, the criteria is. It's always a slippery slope. When the welfare state was first instituted, it was supposed to only help, only help the truly destitute, and only for a little bit of time. And as soon as they got back in their feet, they, and today, in the United States, 47% of the population get money from the government in one way or another. That's just slippery slope. So no, you cannot allow a, even a little bit of coercion into the system. Um, the issue of pollution is a completely different issue. It's an issue that for the most part is solved by property rights. If the rivers and the lakes, and maybe even the oceans are privately owned, then you don't get these kind of pollution because just like you can't throw your garbage in my backyard, you can't dump your garbage in my river. And there are consequences if you do. And we know what the consequences are, we know how to deal with them, and we know how to arbitrate them. So most pollution issues are solved by, uh, by, by private property. The, so the pollution problems that are not solved by private property, um, for example, some forms of air pollution that really hurt people, then yeah, the government has a role to play. If you're clearly doing something that's hurting me, by spewing this chemical into the air, then the government has a right to tell you, no, you can't do that anymore. But first, it has to be proved that it's hurting me, not hypothesized, but proved. Um, and, and there has to be a, a process to, to objectively get to that solution, which, which is not the process we have today. But I'm not saying government has no role, but it has no role to coerce unless harm is being done, unless rights are being violated. Yeah. So two main questions. So uh, firstly, you have spoken of like equal qualities, equal what? Equal opportunities. Yeah. Equal opportunities. So what if the government, for example, enforces a national curriculum to all the students? So and via new technologies such as like uh, video lectures, so that all the students can receive same quality and same lecture. So would that be uh, equal opportunity? And would you support? based on this uh, type of assumption. And the second question is that uh, although, uh, based on your argument, inequality does not create economic problems, however, it does create political problems. So like if the society is too in equality that some of the poor people are p pissed, and especially sure. America under uh, democracy, people are just gonna elect somebody like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Yeah. She's gonna uh, advocate. Oh, they already have. Yeah. Um, so let me take the first question. First, I don't believe in equality of opportunity. I try to make that clear, right? Because equality of opportunity still requires violence. It still requires tying up LeBron James just to give me an opportunity, not to give me an equal outcome. You have to restrict him. So I don't believe in equality of opportunity. Opportunity is just another form of outcome. It's just an earlier form of outcome, but it's still an outcome. And for example, if you taught exactly the same curriculum with the same video and the same professor to every single student, it's still not equal opportunity. Because some people have higher IQs than others and they absorb it much faster. Some people respond to visual stimulation and some people respond to written stimulation and some people respond to other forms. We all have different learning styles. So you can't establish a curriculum. This is one of the things that I think is so evil about national curricula and government trying to dictate curriculum is different kids respond differently you need to be able to experiment and you need to be able to customize curriculum to the particular students rather than have one standardized thing for everybody uh, so no I don't believe in equal opportunity I, what I want to do is maximize opportunity create a world in which if you want to take advantage of the opportunities they're there for you to take advantage of them and if you don't, you suffer the consequences. I don't suffer the consequences for you, you suffer them. So I want to create a, a world of maximum freedom, which means a world with maximum opportunities. So I'd like to see competition in education. I'd like to see different models of education. I'd like to see people just like we sort each other out, we sort out what kind of products we consume, we consume different things, we read different books, we, we like different movies, um, we drive different cars, we should be able to experience different education systems based on our preferences, based on our parents' preferences. 
So imagine education treating you like a consumer versus education today where the consumer is the teacher, really. The teacher is, is, is the one to be pleased. Who cares about the students? Nobody cares about the students. Nobody's ever done a survey of whether you're happy or not or whether your parents are happy with the education you're getting. You're, you're not treated as a consumer, you're treated as a nuisance. The second question was, give me one word. Uh, this is the problem with two questions again. Causing political problems. Causing political problems. See, I don't think inequality causes political problems. I think talk about inequality causes political problems. <laughs> I think Americans are being told that they have their lives, they, they're, um, that they are poorer today than they were 30 years ago. Americans are being told that they're stagnating. Americans are being told that the rich have, have gotten richer at their expense. And if you tell that story over and over and over again, people start believing it. 15 years ago, nobody talked about inequality. It wasn't an issue. Nobody discussed it, never came up. It's only in the last eight, nine, 10 years, really since the, the financial crisis, that people have been talking about inequality. It's become a talking point, an ideological talking point. People are motivated by ideas. People are motivated by beliefs. Beliefs that they absorb from intellectuals. Inequality is an issue that intellectuals have created, that intellectuals have preached, and that people have bought into. Not because it's real, but because that's what the smart people have told us. People are upset. People are alienated. People are pissed off because they don't understand the world in which they live in, because the intellectuals have deceived them and lied to them for, for decades and decades and decades. And the system that actually allows people to succeed in life is capitalism. And the capitalism is de denounced over and over and over again by our intellectual classes and by your professors and by your teachers and by the people in the, in the media and by pretty much everybody in the political class as well. Capitalism is not argued for so people are confused, they have no idea what's going on. And then they're told, all your problems are caused by inequality. And you should be really, really angry at the rich guys. Americans never cared about inequality. Americans' attitude towards the rich guy who lived in a big house on the hill was, I want to be him. I don't resent it, I want to be that. And you know what, even if I never be it, good for him. Cool, he made it. That's the American dream, that's the American ideology. It's only now, it's only in modern times, literally the last 10, 15 years, that people have started resenting people who have wealth. They become European. <laughs> no, it's true. Now, Europeans have a history that justifies this to some extent, right? Because how did you become rich three, 400 years ago in Europe? How did you become an aristocrat? What is the meaning of being an aristocrat? Being favored by royalty? Well, but how did you become royalty? How did, how did anybody become anybody in, in so ancient Sam, times? Yeah, yeah but how did, how did you start? Mm -hmm. By stealing it. By having an army, by using a, by being good at the sword, and by stealing it, right? So in, in feudal society, the world is a zero-sum game. And some people exploit other people, some people get rich by exploiting other people. That's feudalism. That's the nature of feudalism, whether it's in China or whether it's in Europe, right? So. In Europe, all the wealth, the historical wealth was accumulated by, through feudalism, in the hands of the people who were really good at stealing. The crooks. And Europeans never shifted with the Industrial Revolution and, and freedom and uh, capitalism. They never shifted to the idea of wealth being created. In America, we talk about making money because wealth is created. In Europe, it's always about being about distributing money because they think it's a zero-sum world, because they lived for hundreds of years under a zero-sum world. America's a new country, founded with new ideas, so you could make that switch easier. It's all, now, America's becoming more like Europe, with that mentality. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'd like to be uh, moving a little bit from that kind of find a way of bringing it to your debate. Um, it's a one and a half question and a, a comment. Um, first, to give maybe a case whereby um, you say this is this country or this society seems to be doing uh, what you are advocating for, which is very good and I support it very much to say, okay, maybe this country have tried 
uh, to reach this particular way of dealing with this issue. They are not following uh, this inequality kind of syndrome. And time to that, that's my first part, if you, can, you have that. And then the other uh, question is to bring your debate onto the international arena uh, with nation states. As you mentioned that uh, capitalism is good and there are positive issues, uh, the capitalist countries will have succeeded if, if they coerce in one way or the other to societies or nation states about that capitalism, it becomes cohesion. What would you advocate for? Um, wouldn't it be better if non-capitalist society experiences itself that this is not working, so let us change, than somebody trying to make strings tight uh, so that you choose the system they want. Uh, if I am to name an example, I can put societies like Cuba, I can put societies like, I don't know if Venezuela enters it there, but that Cuba is an example, and some African states to say, can they so, so is the question kind of, should we invade Cuba to force them to be capitalist? Yeah. My answer is no. Not because I don't think that would be good for Cuba, I think it would be great for Cuba, um, but because I wouldn't want my son to die in a war with Cuba to make Cuba better. <laughs> it's just too expensive. And I don't want to spend my money on freeing Cuba. Cuba is Cuba's problem, not my problem. But freedom is good. Freedom is good for Cuba. Freedom is good for Venezuela. Freedom is good for every country that tries it. And I don't believe in using force to do it, but I do believe in using persuasion to do it. I believe that we should be exporting the ideas of capitalism, the ideas of individual rights, the ideas of freedom, individual liberty and individual freedom to every country in the world. And I travel to large parts of the world trying to do that, trying to convince me. I mean, I have to do it in America and in Europe as well because they don't believe in it anymore either. I mean, there is no capitalist country in the world today, particularly as the last bastion of, country of, of capitalism, Hong Kong, descends into, uh, descends into China um, <laughs> and away from capitalism. So, you know, uh, I believe that we have to advocate for these ideas. I don't believe we should bring them on to people by force, although there's no question in my mind if we did that, they would be better off. It's just that it's too expensive and it's, it's not justifiable to do it. Um, the ideas work, and most societies don't learn it. And we think about societies learning. What about all the people who die in the meantime? All the babies in Venezuela who are dying because of starvation right now. All the, all the people who, who have to leave their homes and are refugees in Colombia or in Brazil because they, don't, they can't make a living in Venezuela and they're starving. What about all those people? While the society learns the lesson. Learning the lesson is very, very painful. It's, it's violent in and of itself, right? So, you know, if somebody went in there and, and cleaned it up for them, maybe they'd be better off. Particularly in a place like Venezuela, who, where, where I think it wouldn't be that hard to do. But, but, and I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying, it, it, you know, you have to think about the, whose incentive it is and, and who has an interest in doing it. But the Venezuela should welcome it because they've got a corrupt, collectivist, you know, uh, 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 kleptocrat stealing all their money and, and denying them the ability to be free and to eat. So people suffer when you don't have capitalism. People in Cuba are poor and, and suffer and the political prisoners in jail and it's a horrible, horrible place. So don't you want, I, I want to liberate it. I, you know, again, I don't want to send troops in, but I would like to see it liberated. I'd like to see people free. I'd like to see people pursuing happiness. Um, my point of contention will be like, how, how did you reach to the point of saying uh, capitalism is good? It's because you experience it. 
No. I mean, no, because I, because to some extent I haven't experienced it because I don't think capitalism really exists in the world. Um, no, I study history, and history is available to everybody. History is available to Venezuelans. History is available to Cubans. History is available to Africa. History is available to China. You can look at history, and you can evaluate. And history is very clear. The closer an economy comes to capitalism, the better it does. The closer it comes to socialism, the worse it does. Direct correlation. And you can even look today at the Economic Freedom Index. And you can rank countries based on economic freedom, and you can measure it relative to wealth. And for the most part, there's a high degree of correlation. So this is not some mystery that you have to live it. Right? Because if you had to live it, then nobody would ever become a capitalist, because what happened to the first one? Right? How did the first one become a capitalist? How did, uh, how did the American founders of America know freedom was good? They never experienced it. They had a king. But they knew, theoretically, they knew that it was the right thing, and they fought for it. And I'm saying, I know that freedom is good for Cuba. Cuba has to fight for it. People have to fight for it. I, I mean, the question is, am I willing to fight for them? No. I'm willing to help them, but I'm not willing, they need to fight for themselves. But it requires a fight. And, and everybody, the knowledge that freedom and capitalism are good and work is available to every human being on the planet today. Oh, every is an exaggeration. Most human beings on the planet. Vast majority of them. How do you bring China and uh, Singapore in the equation? Well, China and Singapore, I think, are still very different. Uh, Singapore is significantly freer than China and significantly richer than China on a per capita basis. Uh, China is still very poor uh, on a per capita basis. Uh, a, a GDP per capita in China is something like $6,700. Uh, you know, that the poorest of the poorest of the poor Americans don't live on more than $6,700 a year, right? So um, people think in aggregate, but yeah, when you have 1.4 billion people, you aggregate even a small number, you get a big number. So aggregate GDP is very large, but per capita GDP is very small in China. But um, China, there's a wonderful book, because I don't have time to explain the whole thing. There's a wonderful book by a uh, very famous economist by the name of Ronald Coase, uh, who, uh, who uh, Chicago, very, very famous. Anyway, he wrote this book when he was 101 years old. That's a way to remember, 101 years old. He wrote it with a Chinese co-author, wh whose name I don't remember, unfortunately. Um, and the, b the book is called How China Became Capitalist. Now, I don't think China ever became capitalist, but, so put aside the title, but the book is interesting. And what the book shows, uh, illustrates quite clearly, but also what is logical, is that those areas of the Chinese economy where the government kept its hands off, boomed. Those areas of the economy where the Chinese government pretended people had property rights, because nobody has property rights in China, but they, where they pretended there was property rights, where they created pseudo-property rights, they boomed. Those areas where the government tried to manage, where they try to control the state-run enterprises, tanked. The wealth in China is all being created in the private sector in those industries and those areas geographically where the central government has, le has left them alone. Shenzhen is a great example, right, right here, yeah, right? And it was the first area where the government said, okay, we're not gonna intervene, let's see what happens. And they didn't know because Deng Xiaoping was a complete pragmatist. No ideology, we'll just see what works. I have no idea. And it worked, so he said, okay, let's replicate it. It's sad that he didn't replicate it enough because he was afraid. He was afraid if you gave people too much freedom, they wouldn't want the Communist Party. So he had to maintain some control and some freedom and, and always play that balance. And I think the balance right now is shifting towards more control and less freedom, uh, which is hurting, already hurting economic growth and will hurt economic growth even more in the future. China has lost faith, lost trust, lost belief in the capitalist system since the financial crisis. And as a consequence of that, Chinese economic growth is going to moderate and is going to slow and they're going to have big trouble um, because of the, 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 they, have lost, they have lost momentum towards capitalism. And, and people are not seeing, that's the real, the real story that I think people are missing in China right now. Yeah, I want to ask, um, you think that uh, it's in inevitable that uh, society will move towards more uh, di redistribution of wealth and uh, away from capitalism, uh, given that 
all the examples that we can see around the world. And there was always going to be more poor people, more untalented people, and more like lazy people, um, so that politicians can uh, appeal to that side. So no, I don't think it's inevitable at all. And, and uh, r while right now that's the direction we're moving, there have been periods in history where we moved in the opposite direction. So I, I don't think anything is inevitable. I, you know, I, I'm not a, uh, I don't believe in a dialectic. I don't believe in, uh, in inevitable his historical outcomes like Marx or a lot of people today believe. I, I think it's choices. It's individuals' choices. And I think it's philosophy. And I think in the case of the welfare state, what is driving the welfare state is morality, and, and you know I, I didn't have time today to talk about it, but but if you read Ayn Rand or if you read my book uh, Free Market Revolution, the key is morality. We we unfortunately are raised with a morality that says that our moral focus should be the well-being of other people, and if that is the dominant morality, then yes, the welfare state is inevitable. But I believe, and Ayn Rand believed, or Ayn Rand articulated, and you morality, a morality that changes and says that your primary moral responsibility is your own life, uh, a, 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 an egoistic morality. And I think it is that kind of morality that if people adopt, will lead us towards capitalism. So to me, I, and I call my book, my, my first book was called Free Market Revolution. And I, in, in the book I say that the revolution is not in economics. We know the economics. Capitalism work. I mean, the economics of capitalism, we won that debate a long time ago. Right? Hayek beat Keynes. Um, it's not a political revolution because you get the politicians you deserve. You get the politicians, to, at the end of the day, we all get the politicians we deserve in a democracy or in a semi democracy. The real revolution is a moral revolution. We need a change. We need to change our orientation, we need to change the way we think, we need to change the, the whole focus in life. And when we get enough people to change the way they think about life, about their own life, then they will demand freedom. Because if I'm living for myself, if I want the best life that I can possibly have for me, right, rationally, I want to be free. I don't want anybody telling me how to live. Yeah, I'm back. So if nobody donates at all, then people will die. Are, are fine with that? So if people are fine with people dying, people die all the time. I mean, how much of how much of your income, how much of your income or your parents' income, do you send to Africa to prevent people from dying of starvation right now today? Because right now you could write a check and save a person in Africa right now. I don't I don't send any money, and people die. I mean, I know ethicists and philosophers who tell me that people die because I don't send a check, and I say okay. I mean, I mean, I live my life, and I help the people close to me, right? So already people die. Now I know, I believe strongly, that free people are incredibly benevolent people. And that my guess is you'd have surpluses, not deficits, in terms of helping the poor. I don't think people will die. And the solution to Africa, those starving kids, is freedom, not my check, right? But I'm willing to volunteer to go speak in Africa and try to convince them of freedom, right? So because so I want to use a tool that actually means something, not a tool that's uh, terribly. But I think that in a free society there will be enough money so nobody will die. But if there isn't, then people will die. That's the concept. There are always consequences to actions, and I, I don't think that because somebody dies, there's an excuse to pull out a gun and force me to do something. It's not my fault. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just uh, have two questions. The first one is like how your philosophy you know, escape from the nature of like people who always want to steal. You know, whenever they get the opportunity to steal, they try to take advantage of the political system like the government, the welfare state, to yeah. steal yeah. for more wealth for yeah. myself. Because it is like human nature, right? Then how can we solve this problem? Once we are government, we see that we cannot escape from this. Yeah. And the second question is like. Uh, what you have mentioned a lot of example is about the creative destruction, like a lot of entrepreneurs, they invent a lot of new things, which yeah. is good for everybody. Sure. But what we see right now is a lot of like, you know, a lot of public de developers, they just, you know, own the place and they do not do anything. They just rent it out for those who can afford to pay the rent. And then they are not inventing something new. By the same time they can get Well, they developed new. something. The building didn't exist before. I, I mean, like, okay, like, I mean, that's... If, if they didn't build the building, but they just buy it from somebody else. 
And it yeah, but, but you know, the, so the fact that they bought it from somebody else gave an incentive to somebody to build it, and therefore it was built. So it, it all it all is a productive activity. But let me let me take the first part, and, and the first part is there's a there's two parts to it really. One is this idea of uh, human propensity to steal, which I don't think is part of human nature, but but we'll talk about that. And the second is cronyism. The, the idea of manipulating government in your favor, uh, right, which, which we all think is bad, I think everybody thinks is bad. The, the one about manipulating government in your favor is easy to solve in my view. The more impotent you make the government, the less reason there is to try to manipulate them. And to, to, if, the less they have, the less there is to steal. So capitalism means, this is why I said there's no capitalism in the world today, Capitalism means a separation of state from economics. Imagine a government that had no economic power, didn't print money because money was private, it was competition in currencies, it didn't regulate, markets regulated, it didn't have, you know, complex tax systems, it couldn't give you any favors even if it wanted to. It basically had a police. A, a military and a judicial system to arbitrate disputes, but had no economic power, then there's nothing to steal. Uh, my favorite example of this is Microsoft. Everybody know Microsoft? I think the, today the largest company in the world uh, based on market cap. In 1990, I think it was 1996, Microsoft at the time was spending zero dollars on lobbying. No lobbying in Washington, D.C. No lawyers, no office in Washington, no building in Washington, no lobby, nothing, no involvement in politics. They said, you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone, we're not interested, we're too busy changing the world. But we're actually making stuff. You guys don't make anything, we have no business with you. So Congress brought them in front of the Senate. And a famous Senator, Arlen Hatch, he just retired, he was from Utah, a Republican, not even a Democrat, stood up and he yelled at the Microsoft executives, you guys need to build a building in Washington, D.C. You need to hire lobbyists. You need to hire, you need to, you need to bribe me. He didn't say it that way because you're not allowed to say that in America, but, but that's the equivalent, right? You need to come and, and manipulate the system. You need to get involved. Microsoft said, we're not interested. We're going home. Go back to Seattle. We don't. We don't want to be in Washington D.C. Less than six months later, knock on the door. We're from the antitrust division of the Justice Department, and we're here to sue you for antitrust violations. Why? What was the sin Microsoft committed that it was going to be sued? Anybody know what the sin that Microsoft did, committed? What's that? What? It was giving away a product for free. <laughs> so you guys don't remember this because you weren't born yet. But when, it, when the internet first, when the web first became slightly popular, we had to buy browsers. It like to get Netscape, I think it was cost 60, 70, 80 bucks. I used to, you had to, you had to pay uh, Netscape, download a browser, and then browse the internet, right? And it was complicated and you had to pay for it. And Microsoft said, you know what? With the next version of Windows, we're giving you Internet Explorer for free. That's why the Justice Department went after them. Now, the funny thing is today, all browsers are free. That's the business model that actually worked in the end. Anybody use Netscape? No. But the Justice Department still spent over 10 years destroying Microsoft. For, for about 15 years, Microsoft did nothing new. There was no innovation. It went from the largest company in the world, uh, innovative, productive, growing, to a very mediocre company. And only about eight years ago, the, the Justice Department, they used to have a person at Microsoft who used to approve all corporate decisions. Finally, that person left. And since then, Microsoft has returned to being productive, innovative, and is again the largest company in the world. I mean, government is incredibly destructive. So, what's the lesson Microsoft learned? We better lobby. Because if we don't lobby, they'll screw us. How much money do you think they spent today on lobbying? 
tens of millions of dollars a year. They built this building in Washington, D.C., beautiful high-rise, but equal distance from the White House and Congress, right? And it's, it's you know, and they have law firms, and they have everything, and they, they play the game. Google, when Google was founded in the late 90s, they looked around, the venture capitalists who gave them money looked around, and they saw what happened to Microsoft, and they told Google from day one, you spread the money. You hand it out. Democrats, Republicans, doesn't matter. You give the politicians money. Google has lobbied from day one. What percentage of the adv online advertising market does Google have in the United States? 90% or something? It's technically a monopoly, right? Has the Justice Department ever gone after Google? No. No, because they played the game. They obviously didn't play very well in Europe because the Europeans are going after them. I mean, you have no choice. If the government has power over you, what choice do you have? Now, once you start playing the game, it's a very corrupting game. And it's not just playing defense, you start playing offense. But that's the nature of the system. And the only way to stop it is to change the system. Businessmen, real businessmen, don't want to steal. Real businessmen want to produce. They're very, you know, one of the things that, again, you, you guys might know, in the late 90s, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of fraud in American business. You might, you might have heard of Enron, and there was WorldCom, and there was just like eight, nine of these companies, big companies, and they all committed fraud at about the same time. And then, you know, there was a big uproar in the United States, capitalism was broken, the same usual stuff. All businessmen are crooks. Bill O'Reilly and Fox said all CEOs in America should be fired because they're all crooks. It was really interesting that every one of those companies was in a heavily regulated industry. And there was almost zero fraud in Silicon Valley. Because it's not regulated. If you, if you manage a regulated company, guess who rises to the top? People who like to play politics. Because that's what you have to do to be a CEO of a regulated industry. In a competitive industry, who rises to the top? Unregulated competitive. Real business people. Real business people don't want to make, make money. So I'm making money. Don't want to get money from fraud. They don't want to cheat. They want the self-esteem that comes from producing, from creating, from building. And that's what you need to leverage. So I don't think stealing is human nature. I think stealing, some people are crooks, and they should go to jail, and you should catch them and put them in jail. But uh, I think most people are not crooks. I don't think it's in your self-interest to be a crook. And, uh, and indeed, I think that most productive people, most creative people are not crooks. So you've spoken about the economic moral. Um, just want to hear some of your observations on psychological implications of in countries, societies where there's a heavy focus on trying to equalize? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, I, so the psychological issues that come out of the attempts to equalize. Um, so I'll give you an example. I, uh, I, I grew up in Israel. I don't know if you know Israel. Israel ran one of the great experiments in egalitarianism. It's called the kibbutz. I don't know if you've ever heard of kibbutz. A kibbutz is a, is a mainly agricultural community where everybody is equal. And they took it seriously, right? So for example, on a kibbutz in your apartment, everybody had exactly the same apartment. Everybody had exactly the same apartment. Same layout, same furniture. If one person had a TV, everybody had a TV. And it was easy for everybody to have the same apartment because your kids did not grow up with you in the apartment. The kids grew up in a kid's home. All the kids were not, your kids were not yours. They were the communities. They took this stuff. So all kids got the same education, going back to the same teacher, the same thing. They got the same education in a kid's home and their parents could go visit them for a couple of hours a day, but generally the, you didn't have a kitchen in the house because the kitchen was communally and you worked in the kitchen, you rotated between jobs. So an ideal, you know, a, a, a Marxist ideal. And it was voluntary, so I, you know, I don't have anything against people who want, I mean I do, but I, I'm not gonna force them, I'm not gonna stop them from doing it if they wanna do stupid stuff. 
What was interesting about two things I know. One is it was a complete economic failure. They were heavily subsidized by the government. They couldn't sustain themselves without the subsidies. But second, relating to the psychological issues, these were horrible places to live. People hated each other. They resented each other. They stabbed each other in the back. They slept with each other's wives or husbands or however you want to take it. They, they treated each other horribly. Why? Well, think about it. Even in a place like this, some people worked hard, some people didn't. People who worked hard made exactly the same money, lived in exactly the same apartment, ate exactly the same food as the lazy people. So the people who worked hard resented the lazy people. But the lazy people resented the people who worked hard because they thought the people who worked hard thought they were better than them. Right? At 11 o'clock in the morning, I used to, I used to, I, I worked on one of these kibbutzes. I used to watch people sneaking back to their apartments because they'd done enough work. Other people worked all day. Worked like dogs. They hated each other's guts. And yeah, if everything's communal, then what do you mean your wife? <laughs> communal is communal. If we share our kids, why can't we share our women? Right? I mean, nothing was yours. And that destroyed their self-esteem. It destroyed their capacity to, to, to be happy, the capacity to enjoy life. Everything was about social resentment. And so, you know, um, I don't know if you follow Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson just, just talks about hierarchies and stuff. And there's something to this hierarchy issue. Because what happens is if you equate everything materially, then people try to be better than each other in other ways. Right? And so they start competing on other things. And it gets really ugly. It can get really ugly. So I found that the social environment on the kibbutz was the sickest, most unhealthy I've ever seen anywhere. Because everybody resented everybody for a variety of reasons. The people who were lazy knew they were lazy and felt guilty for being lazy, but could never admit to feeling guilty and had no incentive to change their behavior except that they felt guilty and resented the people who were taught who made them look bad. And you could go on and on with the psychological impact of those kind of relationships. Yeah. So uh, one of the Piketty's point is that uh, social capitals can be inherited across generations. And then, let's say if I'm Li ka Shin san You do what? If I'm uh, Li ka Shin san Hong Kong's wealthiest person. Yeah. And then I can start my business very easily. Yeah. And then now that we have AI, and then uh, it gets easier for rich people to dominate the industry yeah. because it takes uh, really lots of specialized investment to build the infrastructure needed. And then in Hong Kong, many people end up working for Li Ka Ching. And do you s still see this as a sort of freedom? Well, look, so I don't think you have complete freedom in Hong Kong, but, but um, yes, I absolutely see it as freedom. I don't see any problem in it. And I think it's a myth, this idea of, of the ease of inherited wealth. So if you look at societies uh, that really have competition and really have come up somewhat free, like Hong Kong and the United States, um, kids of rich people often lose their money. Um, if you're a rich, spoiled, undeserving child, you're not gonna be able to, you know, AI is hard to manage. <laughs> It's sophisticated, it's complicated. You better have some skill. Money is not the only tool you need in order to manage a company. You need many other skill sets. And if you don't have them because you b were raised, it, uh, you know, kind of shielded from the real world, then you're gonna fail. And many rich kids fail. And so if you look at the richest people in America, first of all, the list changes all the time. Interestingly enough, how? I thought once you become rich, you're always gonna be rich. No, it turns out, that, that people move up and down constantly. Particularly, the freer you are, the freer the society is, the more movement there is, the more up and down you go. It used to be said from short sleeve to short sleeve in three generations. The first generation makes it, the second generation loses it, and the third generation is back in short sleeve. Short sleeve is a symbol of poverty. But indeed, sometimes it happens within one generation. There are lots of stories, particularly from the early days of capitalism when there was real competition and freedom, of people making money and losing it, and making it again, and losing it over one lifetime. Because the market is so dynamic. There are no guarantees. 
So if you look at the list of the richest people in the United States, it changes all the time. Second, most of them are self-made. Most of them did not inherit their wealth. Now yes, you'll see five of the Walton children on the list because Sam Walton was so rich, even when you divide it into five, they'll all make the list of richest people and, and they've all managed the money well. But you don't find Rockefellers on the list anymore. You don't find the children of Carnegie. You don't find the children of a lot of billionaires from the past on that list. Because either was lost or was dissipated or a lot of rich people said and are saying now, I don't want my kids to have a lot of money. Like, uh, I'm, I had the opportunity once to sit down and have lunch with uh, Michael Dell. Right? I don't know, he's worth $30 billion or whatever. Some ridiculous number that you could never spend in many lifetimes. And he said to me, I don't know what to do with my money. He said, I don't want to give it to my kids. Now, he's working really hard and making even more money. We can talk about white people work even when they're that rich more. But it's not to leave the money to the kids because he said, I do not want to leave the money to my kids. I think it will corrupt them. I think it will destroy their life because they won't get a sense of creativity. They'll just, it'll just be handed to them. It'll be on a silver platter. I want them to actually work for the money. So I can build another hospital. I can give it to another charity. I can, but it's hard to actually spend you know, $40 billion or whatever the number is. And, and, and I think most rich people feel that way. I, I, I think, I, I, you know, Bill Gates is already on record, he's not leaving it to his kids. Juan Buffett said he's not leaving it to his kids. Now, it's not that his kids won't get anything. They'll still be richer than I am, and maybe you are, I don't know who your father is. Um, <laughs> maybe you are the son of... Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think, I think people are becoming more aware of the danger of it, and so I don't think it's a big problem. Uh, and look, at the end of the day, I believe in property rights. I believe if you make the money, if I make $10 million, and when I'm dead, this ten, when I'm about to die, this $10 million, it's mine. I can decide to burn it. I can make a big bonfire of all my money and burn it. And it's none of your business. I can decide to give it all away to charity, and it's none of your business. And I can give it all to my kids, and it's still none of your business. So society has no say in what I do with my money. And all inheritance is, is people deciding what to do with their money. And much of it goes to charity, and much of it goes to all kinds of stuff, and some of it goes to children, and it's none of my business. So, I don't, and I don't think it's a problem. I really don't. But even if it was, it's none of my business. Yeah. What would happen to America if the new leftist Democrats, I'd say got the new Green Deal, I'd say got free jobs for everybody, free education for everybody, what would this do to America? Well, we'd destroy it. What do you destroy think it. is the possibility of it happening? In the next 10 years? A zero. I mean, I mean, these are all great ideas that, that are nice to write, but no, nobody takes them seriously. Even Democrats don't take the Green New Deal seriously. It's fantasy, it's stupid, it's ridiculous. N nobody can actually really believe that that's what's going to happen. Um, now, the Democrats will still do destructive stuff, but, but so are the Republicans. So it's just a matter of the speed of destruction. It's not a matter of the direction. The direction is very negative in America. America don't expect America to save you, you guys. I mean, America's going in a very wrong direction. Um, but I, I, I think some of the ideas will become reality. I think we'll get Medicare for all. We'll get socialized medicine. Uh, I think a, a, a Republican president will probably sign it. I, you know, I think Democrats and Republicans will come together and give us socialized medicine. Um, and I think everybody in the whole world will suffer as a consequence. Right now, there's a little bit of freedom in the United States in healthcare. Not a lot, a little bit. Only about 40% of American health care is, is private, 60% is public already. Um, and 75% of all medical innovations happen in the United States. Imagine if you socialize all of the health care in the United States, medical innovation shrinks dramatically, you guys lose. Because right now you're free riding off of us. 
You're free riding off of American freedom. You're free riding off of the fact that we're the only country in the world where we pay the actual cost of drugs. You get you you force the drug companies to give them to I don't know about Hong Kong, but other countries in the world force force uh, the drug companies to give the drugs uh, for for uh, at cost. So we subsidize all the R and D in the world. So all. Almost all medical innovation is a consequence of the American system. If you crush, if you destroy the American system, innovation in healthcare basically goes away to a large extent. So there are massive consequences to even slower decline. I think the big ideas of, of suddenly a wage for everybody, uh, well, I mean, one of the things that happens when you do that, this MMT, modern monetary theory, uh, is inflation. <laughs> it won't take long. Uh, and, and, and then people will give it up and, and move to something different. But the general decline of America is going to be very hard to reverse. Very, very hard to reverse. Because it's psychological, it's philosophical, and, and it's, it's, it's going to require real change people's ideas. And changing people's ideas is very hard. They've been so corrupted by, by 50 years of bad ideas. So, uh, and, and by the way, I think one of the reasons China has taken, uh, has taken a turn away from capitalism is because it looks to America and it, it views America as capitalism has failed and, and we shouldn't pursue that path of freedom. And uh, to, to, to some extent, it's America's fault. America used to be a shining city on a hill and it's no longer, it no longer claims to be, it no longer tries to be, and it no longer is because the ideas are just the same as everywhere else. It's, the, America's become Europe. All the bad ideas. Given that is that place that you would recommend that we move to? <laughs> you live in Hong Kong. I keep recommending people move to Hong Kong. Um, no, I mean, I, I wish there was. I, I, what I recommend is to fight. What I recommend is to speak up is not to accept the path and, and to move when the time comes, because I think the time will come where you will have to move, to move to a place where you can actually have a voice. So when freedom of speech gets destroyed in Hong Kong, as it's being destroyed in China right now, um, it never was huge in China, but it's, it's, it's deteriorating in China. If that reaches a point when China, you, in Hong Kong you can't speak your mind, then it's time to move. And you gotta move to a place where you can't speak. And the only way to change the world is to speak. It's about speaking, 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 speaking. That's all you can do. And uh, but you got to fight. If you just if you just sit back and do your thing and ignore the world, then the world will get worse. Because it's it, the momentum, the 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 the, the momentum is with the status quo. The status quo is against freedom. It's against uh, free markets. It's against capitalism. Sadly. I hate to be pessimistic because I'm an optimistic guy. Kind of What's technology doing then for just to end on that point? Well, I mean, technology is making our lives like super cool, right? Yeah. I mean, technology is just great. And, and life generally is great, right? I mean, in spite of all the problems, life is good. Uh, we live at a high standard of living that anybody could have ever imagined, even 20 years ago. Part of this, part of the angst that Americans feel is com completely artificial. Now maybe we should turn it on. I like you're talking about technology. Is that thing yeah. stuttering about? Yeah, and technology is <laughs> not. <laughs> um, we live in, a, in, in the best of times in many respects, right? So Americans who think they've stagnated forget that 20 years ago they didn't have an iPhone. They forget that they had no internet 25 years ago. People who long for the 1970s I remember the 1970s. There's nothing worthwhile from the 1970s except some rock and roll. <laughs> That's it. There was good music in the 70s. That's it. You know, at Queen and Pink Floyd. Right? That's what the 70s were good for. That's about it. Um, life sucked in the 70s. Crime rates were dramatically higher than they are today all over the world, primarily in the United States. I remember being in New York City in the 1970s, not going to Central Park, Park during the day because you were afraid to be mugged. During the day. Today, I have no qualms walking in Central Park at 2 a.m. 
That's the difference in New York City. Um, technology, I mean, again, punch cards, rooms full of computers versus an iPhone versus your PC versus flying. Flying was super expensive, super expensive, really, really bad. Yes, if you were in first class, you got wonderful treatment, but nobody was in first class. I mean, I mean, really, there was inequality. Almost nobody got to be in first class. And, you know, nobody traveled. Think of the, just the sheer number of human beings today who travel for leisure. The, just the number of tourists today is exponentially greater than it was 30 years ago. So those America, Americans in the Rust Belt who complain all day, they go on trips to Europe, they go on vacations. They couldn't afford that in the 1970s. So part of this inequality debate has convinced people their life sucks. But it doesn't. Objectively, by any real measure, it doesn't because they got to read Harry Potter. I mean, the equivalent of that, right? They got a benefit from all these things that made some people rich. They got a benefit from all the wealth that Silicon Valley created that they hold. They created gazillion times more out there for us. So every billionaire created trillions. Every billionaire created trillions of wealth. Where did that go? We have it. If we appreciated the lives we have, then there wouldn't be that angst. But the angst is artificial. It's psychological. It's being, not brainwashed, but people are being convinced that. I just want to say something, perhaps a little silly, but sometimes we look to the animal kingdom for inspiration or guidance. And I was listening to um, um, an animal behaviorist who had two little monkeys. You probably know this experiment. And was feeding them both cucumbers. And um, at one point starts feeding one grapes, I think, and then the other one gets jealous maybe and just kind of retaliates, it stops eating because he also wants oh, grapes. grapes yeah. And the person interviewing the behaviorist said, you see, even animals know what's um, egalitarian. And I thought, wow, that's the wrong conclusion to draw from that's that. exactly the opposite. Yeah. Right, yes, animals can handle inequality. Human beings are different. We have something that animals don't have. What do we have? Reason. reason. We have the capacity to figure it out. We have the capacity to reason. So we're, we're a different type of animal. And perhaps there's no effort involved. They were just being given the food. There's no effort involved. And, but again, they're, they're at the perceptual level. They can't think abstractly. We can't. Thank you. I think we just take the last one. Okay, so we got three quick questions. Yes. Oh. Um, as you mentioned several times before, uh, maybe rich people don't know actually how to, what to do with their money, right? So why should a middle class work harder and harder to always like, earn more if at the end you don't actually know what to do with them? I, I mean, I was being somewhat facetious when I said that, right? Rich people know what to do with their money. Um, for example, Jeff Bezos is going to go use it to go to Mars. Um, the reason to make money mostly is not for the purpose of making money. The reason to make money is because money is a signal that you're producing value. We need to know that what we're doing is valuable. The way we know what we're doing is valuable is because the market is paying us for it. Other people see the value of what we're doing. So the reason a billionaire who, who can't spend it all, who doesn't have the vision of going to Mars, let's say, literally won't be, keeps working, keeps working hard, not just the middle class, but Michael Dell works harder now than probably he did 20 years. I mean, he's working mergers and he, he took his company private and now he's getting in public. I mean, he works really hard. Why? Because it's fun. <laughs> and if he doesn't get money, how does he know that the fun is value added? The money is a symbol of the value he's adding. For every dollar he gets, he's created many dollars out there. And that's the beauty of it. The beauty of it is money is a, is, is a symbol. It's not a value in and of itself. And about beyond a certain point, it's not even a value in a sense that it allows you to consume. It now becomes a value just as, as, a, as, a, as a 
keeping track of how much value you create. So why don't you just give it away once you have it? Well, they do. I mean, a lot of it they do give away. They don't give it all away because they're trying to constantly think about how to do the best job of giving of, of using it, whether through investment or whether through giving it away. Giving it away is not easy. Right? So think about Bill Gates. Bill Gates spends all his time today giving his money away. That's his foundation. Um, all of these guys, if, if, you, if you go in Austin, Texas, you'll see building after building. Michael Dell Hospital, the Michael Dell this, the Michael, I mean, he is giving it away, but I mean, it's hard to give away that kind of money and do it in a way that you believe is creating value. See, when you produce stuff, when you produce stuff, you know that what you're doing is creating value because you're making money. When you give it away, you don't know it's creating value. It's very tricky. Just giving it to somebody doesn't mean it's creating value. Maybe it's spoiling the bottle. Maybe they're gonna waste it. You know, maybe we don't need another hospital. Maybe we have enough hospitals. How do you know? When you don't have the profit motive, when you don't have money as a, as a signal, then I've run a non-for-profit. And it's very hard to run a non-for-profit because you don't, and, and, I'll, and my donors complain. Like, how do we know you're having an impact? Because there's no profit. The beauty, see, we think profit is a negative. I view profit as a positive. When you make a profit, it means you've created lots of value. You've had a positive impact on the world. You've made the world a better place. So I would like to see these entrepreneurs not give the money away. I'd like to see them invest it. Start venture capital firms. Put it to young entrepreneurs. Help people create more profit. The world becomes better. People become less poor because of profit because of jobs, not because of charity. China did not, erat, did not move, I don't know, 600 million people out of poverty because of charity. But by creating jobs, by making investments, by allowing capitalism. I just don't think that having more money makes you like more like happier. So actually once, well, once you reach a I I think it definitely does. So first of all, money does buy happiness. Up to a point, <laughs> absolutely by Up happiness. to a point, and then after that, like... Now, it's not guaranteed that you'll get happiness, but being poor is not being happy, right? You need a certain amount of money to be happy. I, I mean, just think about the ability to have medical treatments or to get your family to, or, or to go on vacations or to do things that are really enjoyable and fun. You need that. But more importantly, the process of making money <laughs> is what makes you happy. It's not the money. So the reason people keep working is because the process is fun. But if the process didn't generate money, it wouldn't make them happy. Because then they wouldn't know that the process was creating value. You think of money as just this thing we have to buy stuff. But no, money is the signal that we created value in the world. People are paying me, people pay me not because they like me, but because they think I've added something to their lives. I've made their lives a little bit better. So the more they pay me, the more I've made their life better. <laughs> but I do it not to get the money, I do it because I love doing what I do. And that's what all entrepreneurs do, they love the process. Otherwise they don't retire. I mean today, some of these billionaires have become billionaires like what, what Zuckerberg became a billionaire, what, 28 or something? Some ridiculous age like that, right? He should have retired right there because he's never spent it all. But he didn't. He keeps working. He works harder and harder and harder. Why? Because he loves it. Because it's fun. Yeah, we'll take the last yeah, two in the back there. Oh, um, if, you were, if you were a lecturer before the days of the Industrial Revolution, when people were citizens farming and, and didn't have the options that we do today, how would your message change or would it change? Or, I mean, what would you say to those people who didn't have those choices? Everything would change. I, I have no clue. I mean, before the Industrial Revolution, we didn't know anything, or we didn't knew very little. Now, if I was like brilliant, which I'm not, so if I was like a genius, like Adam Smith or something, then I, I, I tell them, hey, we got to get rid of this agrarian stuff, and we got to establish capitalism, we got to establish, you know, freedom, and and when we do all these wonderful things, would happen. But I don't think I would have known that, right? And I think very few people knew that, and it took. It, it took the geniuses to teach us that, 
us to experiment with it, see that it worked, and 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 take off like the founding fathers and like people like Adam Smith and other uh, uh, great visionaries of the time. But so these aren't universal, like timeless. They are timeless, but but you can't fully understand them until you've done. I mean, so there's a sense in which we have to practice it, right? So to fully understand. So we have more knowledge about capitalism today than Adam Smith did. And we understand more what it entails than he did. So I can, I, I, I'd give a, you would give a, and Ayn Rand actually says, Ayn Rand said that you couldn't have developed her ethics without seeing the Industrial Revolution. Because what the Industrial Revolution taught Ayn Rand was the efficacy of reason. I mean, we always knew reason and efficacious. You could do science, you could do theoretical stuff. But what the Industrial Revolution taught us is that reason applied to reality raises the standard of living, you know, just creates this amazing, and that you had to see to believe. And nobody talked about, it. yes, what we really need is to liberate reason, right? Adam Smith doesn't talk that way, nobody talks that way, right? But that's how they should have talked if they really understood what they were talking about, of course. But Ayn Rand says, no, we had to see it before we could really explain it. And now that we understand it, that's what we advocate for. So everything would be different. I can't even imagine what kind of talk I would give then. And 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 I, I'd have to do a lot of hand waving because I can prove a lot of this stuff. Now I can just point. Like, just study a little bit of history and you can see the truth. Yeah, last question. So the, the high debt levels all over the world concern you? Yeah, so we're <laughs> going back to the pessimism. Yes, I mean, very much so. Particularly the high debt levels in the United States. I think those are the worst in many respects. Because while Japan has higher debt levels, most of its debt is to itself. So, uh, yes, Chinese are suffering because of the high debt levels already. The consequence of high debt levels is stagnation. Uh, Japan has seen its economy grow very, very slowly. I believe that low economic growth in the United States over the last decade, two decades, has been to a large extent a result of the high debt levels and the heavy regulations, uh, and it's only gonna get worse. So I don't know if the consequence is gonna be a crash or just slow debt. And I'm not sure which is worse. Uh, but yeah, I'm very worried. I think you I mean, I used to say Europe is the past, America is the present, and Asia is the future. Now I worry that there is no future, because Asia is going in the wrong direction. At least chi China is Asia, and China is going in the wrong direction. So that really worries me. So what about the concept of a sharing society? Concept of a what? Sharing society. <coughs> yeah, trying to share all these sources. There is no such thing as a sharing society. I mean, it's a bogus notion, right? Um, I'm not sharing my Uber, I'm charging you money. I'm not sharing my car. I mean, all the sharing society does is it's an improved utilization of assets, which is great. So I have, I had a spare bedroom in my house. I'm not sharing it with you. I'm charging you for it. So uh, all it is is, you, is, 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 is is using technology to better utilize existing assets, and that's fabulous. I think it's great. It's, it's one of those technological trends that is saving us and making us richer at the same time as politicians are trying to destroy wealth, entrepreneurs are trying to create wealth. And the question is what will happen faster? The wealth created by entrepreneurs and these businesses and the sharing economy and so on, or the destruction of the politicians? And right now, more wealth is being created than is being destroyed, so economies are still growing. But how long is that sustainable? I don't know. I really don't know. Now technology is amazing, so maybe technology will save us and, and allow for economic growth in spite of the horrible stuff. And once in a while, I give a lecture on being rationally optimistic. And that's the path, that's the path I adopt. But I'm not 100% consistent.